My name is uh, Steve Thomas. I'm Professor of Energy Policy at the University of Greenwich in London and I've worked for 25 or 30 years on energy policy research. What I'd like to talk to you today about is the uh, reforms to the British electricity market that took place uh, more than 20 years ago and which are now in a phase of, of new reforms. The perception of the British electricity market reforms is that they were highly successful and they are a model that, that others should follow. What I'd like to show to you today is that they were never what they were seen to be and now belatedly the government and the regulator has recognised that and a process of new reform is underway which will lead to a very different market structure which may be no more successful than the previous ones. So in detail, what I'd like to talk to you about is what uh, three years ago when this new reform started, what the British market looked like in theory and in reality. Then I want to talk about the proposals that the government has put forward for electricity market reform to just show you what they are and to give you some evaluation of them. And finally, to look at how this these reforms will place the UK in relation to the European Commission. Will these reforms put the UK on a collision course with the European Commission? Well, the theory of the UK electricity market uh, three years ago was that we had six competing companies uh, uh, with no dominant player. And this is not perfect from a competition point of view, but it's probably better than almost any other market in Europe. It, there is at least a, a, a significant number of competing companies. A wholesale market has existed since 1990. It was reformed in 2002 from a pool type model to uh, uh, something closer to a commodities market, but it's existed for more than 20 years. We've had retail competition for all consumers since 1998, and we have the highest consumer switching rate for small consumers in Europe, something in the order of 20% of consumers change their electricity supply every year. We've had an independent regulator in place since uh, a year before privatisation and reform took place in 1990. The transmission system has been uh, fully unbundled for more than 20 years. The distribution system has also been fully unbundled for more than 10 years. So from a theoretical point of view, we have all the elements of the ideal uh, electricity market in place and have had so for more than 10 years. The reality is a little bit different to that. Four of the six large companies are foreign owned. Electricité de France, RWE and Aon from Germany and Iberdrola from Spain. I'm not sure whether this matters or not, but it's clearly not a situation that would be tolerated in many other European countries. More importantly, the six large companies are integrated generator retailers. In other words, they own nearly all of the generation and they own and they dominate entirely the retail market. What this means is that the wholesale market is going to struggle to be important. And remember that without a properly functioning wholesale electricity market, electricity market reforms have no point. Without a properly functioning wholesale electricity market, retail competition makes no sense. Without a properly functioning wholesale electricity market, there can be no signals for investment uh, and the security of supply falls into, into uh, question. So the wholesale market is very important. But the problem is that because these companies own the generation and they also supply most of the retail, most of the generation does not go through the wholesale market. It's self-supply from the generation division to the retail division. And that's probably 60 or 70 percent of generation in Britain is covered in that way. Nearly all of the rest is covered by confidential long-term contracts. And perhaps 1 percent of the market is actually traded on the open spot market. And that means that prices are very unreliable. They are not a basis for uh, pricing electricity and they certainly don't provide uh, 
an investment signal for new power plants. So in that respect, the wholesale market is failing in Britain. The six large companies in practice supply their small consumers from their own plant. So as far as small consumers go, none of the power that they're buying comes through the wholesale market. Some of it goes through the market for the large consumers, but they're a very different market and they're supplied by annual contracts and very different. If we look in more detail at the retail market, in theory, it looks like six companies with about a sixth of the market each. In practice, the market is very regionalised and it's based on the old monopoly structure where there were 14 monopoly regions. Those 14 monopoly regions are owned by the six big companies who typically own two or three regions each. And in each of those regions, the previous monopoly company has about 60 or 70 percent of the market. British Gas, selling gas and electricity as a package, has 20 or 30 percent and the other four companies have less than 10 percent between them. So typically the retail markets are regional duopolies. They are not a market with six competing companies. About most of consumers, when they do switch, it's clear that they don't know how to find the best deal. And, uh, Research from about 10 years ago found that about two-thirds of consumers, when they switched, didn't get to the best deal that they could. And some of them even switched to a worse deal than they'd started with. And that research was confirmed again in, in recent months when the consumer organisation, which found again that two-thirds of people, when you put them in front of a price comparison chart, couldn't find the best deal for them. So there's increasing public disillusionment with the electricity industry. For the first decade or so after privatisation, prices came down rather slowly, 1 or 2% per year, so that about 20% price reduction was in place by 2002. Since then, prices have only gone upwards, and typically consumers perceive that prices go up very quickly and come down very slowly. So they are very cynical about the market as a whole. They see it as the companies making profits from them. And the, the uh, figure of 20%, 25% of consumers switching again is a little bit misleading because those switches tend to be the same people. Most people do not switch, have never switched, never will switch. About 20% of consumers switch regularly, they know how to work the market, they can find the best deal and they switch to that. But most people are not participating in the market. This, the price rises which uh, in past few years electricity prices have more than doubled are, is beginning to lead to serious social problems. Ten years ago, about one and a half million consumers were suffering from what is known as fuel poverty. In other words, they spend more than 10% of their income on their energy bills. Because of the price rises, that figure has gone up by a factor of four or five. Uh, and tariffs for prepayment meters, which is a significant uh, element of the British market, about Nearly 20% of consumers uh, buy their electricity using prepayment meters and typically these are the lowest income households. Tariffs for those prepayment meters are about 20 or 25% higher than the cheapest tariffs. So we have a very serious uh, and increasingly important problem of fuel poverty that we are not addressing. Consumers also find that the companies have many tariffs and they find it very difficult to select the one that is best for them. So, and there is a perception that the companies are deliberately making them uh, com complicated and confusing. So consumers will be paying more for their energy than they need to be. The regulator is seen as ineffective. We've had retail competition for 15 years, yet every year we find retail companies being fined large amounts of money because they are 
uh, misleading consumers and tricking them into switching to their company. So the, the regulator does not appear to be able to get on top of the issues that are causing major problems. In February 2010, things changed. Uh, the energy minister announced that NITA, that's the wholesale electricity market in which electricity is traded, is not working. It doesn't give sufficient guarantees to developers of wind turbine and nuclear plants. He said, we are going to need a more interventionist energy policy to deliver the low carbon investment we need. In other words, he was saying, look, it might have worked up to now, but for the future, if we want to reduce our carbon emissions, we need a different system. A day later, the chief executive of the regulatory body, Ofgem, Alistair Buchanan, said something quite similar but subtly different. He said, there's an unprecedented combination of factors. He named global financial crisis and so on. To say that there is some sort of crisis uh, coming up. Uh, and he said that there is doubt that the current energy arrangements will deliver secure and sustainable energy supplies. There is an increasing consensus that leaving the present system as it is, is not an option. So what he was saying was slightly different. He was saying that if we don't change things, the lights might go off. We certainly won't get the low carbon energy ne we need. What these two statements led to was a process called electricity market reform, which went on after the general election of two or three months later with the new government. So there's cross-party agreement on the need for change. Of course, those statements do give rise to a number of questions. What, what was actually different to the situation in the previous years? Why had the uh, government come to a conclusion that should have been obvious for the previous 20 years? Nothing different had happened to what was happened for the previous years. So why did they suddenly say there was a crisis? Uh, and that's a very difficult question to answer. But the result was this process of electricity market reform, which ended with the publication of a new law, the Energy Bill, which was published in December of last year and is in the process of going through parliamentary acceptance uh, as I speak and will continue to go on beyond the next general election. It's a rather unusual and strange form of, uh, of, of law. What are the main proposals in the bill? Well, the first proposal is that there should be a carbon price floor which was actually announced a couple of years previously. And the carbon price floor is based on the European Union emissions trading system, the EU ETS, which is seen not to have been functioning very well and not providing uh, reliable uh, and logical prices. So what the government has proposed is that they would put a, a floor on the carbon price. So the carbon price would be below uh, uh, be above a certain minimum price and that would give the certainty that investors in low carbon sources would need to make that investment. The second element was the introduction of long-term contracts. Uh, effectively this means a feed-in tariff uh, and the contractual form, um, I shouldn't spend too long on this, it's just a, uh, a, a contractual detail, is called contracts for differences and this will provide essentially long-term financial incentives to invest in all forms of low carbon generation, so nuclear power as well as renewables, and essentially it will be a long-term power purchase agreement. The third element is a capacity market, and I'll come back to that later. The, the proposals on that are not well developed and publicised yet. The second uh, the fourth main proposal was emissions performance standards and essentially what that means is that it prevents uh, developers building new coal-fired power stations unless they have carbon capture and storage fitted to them. The fifth me measure is liquidity measures to enable the government to take action to improve the liquidity of the electricity market should it prove necessary. And this goes back to the issue that I mentioned earlier, that uh, the liquidity of the wholesale electricity market is very low, and as a result, the, um, the prices are not reliable for price signals. 
and what the government is proposing to do is bring in some measures that will force the companies to use that uh, wholesale market and make the prices more reliable, make them a better signal for investment. The final proposal relates to the issue that I mentioned earlier of consumer competition and the problem of confusing large numbers of tariffs and what the government is proposing is that there should just be a small number of standard tariff forms so that consumers could easily see which was best for them and they could easily identify which tariff they should be switching to. So let's look at the carbon price floor. What how this will work is that, that low carbon generators will sell their permits to the markets and they will receive the market price. But they will, that will be, if that market price is below the carbon floor, they will be topped up by a, uh, by a, a donation from the government which will be funded by generators using the uh, climate change levy, a tax on fossil fuel generators. It came into effect in April the 1st of 2013 at about 19 euros per tonne of carbon emitted and it will rise to about 43 euros in 2013 prices by 2020 and perhaps 84 euros by 2030, although 2030 is a very speculative price. Now this, this leads to the, uh, to the obvious question is this a sensible recognition that the EU T ETS, which are to 10 years, has never worked very well and seems unlikely to ever work very well? Is this a recognition that it's not going to do what we need it to do? Or is it, is it actually going to prevent the EU TES ever from functioning properly? I'll come back again to the carbon price floor later. So what about the long-term contracts? These are contracts for differences and they're long-term contracts to provide stable and predictable income to those building low carbon sources. And what they mean is that the generators will receive the market price for their electricity but the difference between that market price and the contract price will be settled bilaterally between the two parties of the contract. So if the generator receives less than the contract price from the market, the buyer of the electricity will top up that, um, the, that, that difference. And equally, if the generator receives more than the contract price, they will pay back that extra difference to the contractual, the other side of the contract. The contracts will be written by an agency that does not exist yet and doesn't even have a name but is called in the legislation the CFD counterparty. It will not be set up uh, until after the next general election. So the energy bill is a rather unusual form of law because it will carry on beyond the term of parliament. Most, uh, most laws if they have not been completed by the end of a parliament then they lapse. This one will carry on beyond the next uh, uh, general election. And what this CFD counterparty body will be is essentially it will be a single buyer and the single buyer was an option that was recognized in the first uh, European Electricity Directive of 1996 but was subsequently withdrawn so doesn't exist as an option anymore. There will be some uh, strange uh, mechanism for signing a contract before this agency is created which will essentially mean probably that the uh, energy minister will sign those contracts in the interim and then transfer them over to the new agency. The budget for low carbon energy in 2012-13 will be about 2.35 billion rising to 7 billion uh, in 2020-2021 and that appears to be uh, an increasing budget but you have to recall that, that actually it's paying contracts year on year so uh, a contract signed this year has to be paid for in every subsequent year uh, until that contract is completed so the difference between the 2.35 billion now and 7.6 billion in 2020 will just be the contracts that are su supplied in each year. And about 8 
0.8 of a billion uh, pounds of new contracts can be signed in each year as a result of this, this increase in budget. What we don't know is what happens after 2020. And again, when I come on to these uh, issues surrounding nuclear power, there is a risk that the budget will be eaten up entirely by uh, new nuclear power plants. But I'll talk about that later. The problem also is that if we are serious about our carbon targets, then the majority of plants we will have to build will be low carbon plants from now on. In other words, renewables or, or nuclear power. And clearly those will not be built by the market. So we will see that a high, an increasing proportion of wholesale electricity will be covered by plants that are not in the market. And perhaps by 2030, maybe 70% of our power will be coming from plants that are completely outside the market. And that will be a very risky situation for the gas-fired power plants that we will still need for flexibility. And I think it's highly likely that if we want to keep building gas-fired power plants, they will also have to be given long-term contracts because they, won't, they will see uh, selling it into an unpredictable and contracting uh, electricity market as too risky. Which brings me on to the issue of nuclear power and the, gov the UK government is currently negotiating uh, at time of uh, speaking which is June 2013 they're still negotiating with EDF on the terms of a nuclear contract for differences or power purchase agreement. We don't know what the final terms are, but reports in the press suggest that the contract will be 35 to 40 years, that the price will be about £100 per megawatt hour, which is more than double the current wholesale price, that it will allow EDF a 10% real rate of return on investment. And there is a serious issue about who will bear the risk of cost escalation during construction. In other words, if the plant costs twice as much as expected, will that be passed on to consumers or will EDF have to pay that? And will could the public even know what the terms of the contract are? Because uh, some ministers say that the, the contracts will be published, while others say that uh, there may be parts of it that will be regarded as commercially confidential and there is uh, there must be suspicions that the commercially confidential parts will be the ones that the consumers really need to see to understand what they've been signed up for. And again, there is also a suspicion that actually these electricity market reforms that have been going on for three years are not driven by a recognition of failure of the electricity market, but they're driven by uh, a desire to bring new nuclear power plants onto the system. So let's talk about the capacity market. And there is no clarity yet about what the form of this market will be, what it's actually for, whether it's to provide payments for peaking plants, the sort of plant that is needed perhaps once a year for perhaps a few hours, or whether it's something uh, to, to give to all plants to ensure that they are capable so that the government has some certainty that demands will actually be met by the capacity that's available. A particular problem as we move to low carbon markets, particularly those, uh, those uh, that, are, that have a high proportion of renewables in it, is that if a commodity market is not in oversupply, that market price will tend to go down to the marginal price uh, of production. Now, whilst the marginal plants, the plants that are being switched on and off at, at, to meet demand, whilst those are fossil fuel prices, that means that the, uh, the market price will tend to be the market price of fuel, which is not the full price, but it's not zero. But as the marginal plant becomes renewable price, where the marginal cost of generation, in other words, the marginal cost of another kilowatt hour of wind is effectively zero. That means that the market price is going to be driven down to very low levels for a lot of the year. 
And that makes life very difficult for gas-fired plants. And we will need gas-fired power plants to provide flexibility. And that means that their income is very dependent on weather conditions in that year. In a windy year, they might make no income. Uh, in a very still year with no sunshine, they might do very well, but if they went out of business the previous year, that's no, uh, that's no uh, compensation to them. We don't have any serious information in the public domain about the form of the market. There is an expectation that there will be some form of auction in 2015 which will apply for 2018 or 19. But there, until we see the proposals, until those have been debated properly and reviewed by parliamentary scrutiny, we don't know what we're going to get from the capacity market. The other measures, the uh, emissions performance standard, as I said, that simply prevents us building new coal-fired power stations without CCS. The liquidity measures, these have been announced in the last week in, uh, in June, and these will essentially require the big six companies to sell a significant proportion of their output into the wholesale market and to sell to newcomers in the retail market so that uh, new entrants in the retail market can be sure that they will be getting power on the same terms uh, as the big six themselves. Whether these uh, measures will actually be carried out and whether they will be effective is very difficult to tell at this stage. So let's move on then to the, how this places the European government and the European Commission. Are we on a collision course with them? The single buyer option was in the first electricity directive but was withdrawn in the first revision of that in 2003. And the, the European Commission is very much against uh, the idea of the government making investment decisions. It says, public investment that discourages private investments and undermines the internal market must be avoided. So it doesn't look like electricity market reform is going to be looked on favourably by the Commission. What about uh, long-term power purchase agreements? The Commission says, in a well-functioning energy market, ideally addressing costs of externalities, investments in generation should be driven by market considerations rather than subsidies. So again, the, uh, the subsidies that are implicit in the long-term contracts don't look like they're in line with European Commission objectives. What about consumer tariffs and the idea that we should be standardising on a small number of uh, standard uh, tariffs. The Commission says regulators should encourage attractive services and tailor-made and dynamic pricing schemes. So again, that doesn't look like what we're doing is in line what, with what the Commission wants. What about the carbon floor price? Well, the Commission says from 2013 onwards, the carbon market is fully Europeanized, thus enabling the internal market to facilitate the transition towards sustainable low carbon. In other words, it might not have worked now, but it's going to work from now on. So again, they're not going to like the carbon floor price, which is overriding the market and is arguably going to make a big distortion to it. What about capacity payments? The Commission says, the Commission is of the view that if capacity mechanisms are not well designed and or are introduced prematurely or without proper coordination at EU level, they risk being counterproductive. So again, the proposals by Britain to introduce capacity payments don't look like they're going to be looked unfavourably by the European Commission. What about the contracts that we're uh, thinking of signing for nuclear? And there is the issue here of state aid. Is the contract illegal state aid? We can divide that into two questions. Is it actually state aid? Uh, and the, the test is, is there a benefit? Well, clearly there is a benefit because EDF will not, would not build a nuclear power plant unless it had that contract. So clearly there is a benefit. Is it granted by the state and through state resources? Yes, clearly it is. The counterparty body that is part of the new energy bill will be owned by the state. It will be funded by consumers and for these purposes, consumers are state resources. So very clearly it is state aid. The second test is, does it distort the market? 
and again we can divide that into two. Does it favour certain undertakings or the production of certain goods? Yes, clearly it does. The, European, the UK government is negotiating only with EDF. No other country, company is involved and the negotiations only apply to nuclear power. So that test is clearly met. Is it liable to distort competition and affect trade between member states? Yes, clearly it is, because if the government's plans uh, to build 10 new nuclear power plants are, are carried out, that will account for 35, perhaps to 40% of the UK's electricity market being outside market terms. So that will be closed to uh, other companies and to other uh, EU member states. So clearly it does distort the market. But this year the European Union is conducting a, a review of its guidance on state aid guidelines and there is a very, uh, it's very likely that the uh, guidelines will be changed so that the, the provisions, the block exemptions that allow subsidies for renewables will be extended to nuclear power. It will be an interesting uh, political uh, arithmetic whether enough member states will come down in favour of nuclear power to include nuclear power in that. If the guidelines are changed in that way that means that uh, the issue of whether the contracts are state aid becomes irrelevant. At the uh, you will find on the uh, the uh, video you will find some links to references that will uh, give you more information on the uh, material that I've presented to you today. There are links on consumer switching, the energy bill, the commission position on electricity markets, my critique of the position of the commission on electricity markets and a review of the nuclear contracts and whether they will uh, full foul of state aid legislation at an EU level. Thank you.